We've talked about the electron configuration of the H2 molecule, and now we want to extend that type of uh, nomenclature of electron configurations all the way up to the uh, neon 2 molecule, all of these homonuclear diatomics here. So all of these diatomics um, have the same nucleus on each side, and then there's some internuclear axis. We're going to use some linear combination of atomic orbitals, which our basis set is just the 1s, 2s, and 2p orbitals on each atom, and then they're going to combine to give us uh, these molecular orbitals in the middle starting from these atomic orbitals uh, on the sides of these diagrams here. Okay, so just like with H2, our lowest energy orbitals are the 1s orbitals, and those overlap positively to form <clears throat> what we saw last time, which is the lowest energy, the 1 sigma g bonding orbital, and then you have the 1 sigma, g, 1 sigma u antibonding orbital. And an antibonding orbital is just something that is less stable than the two than the uh, energy of the orbitals of the separate atoms, and a bonding orbital is something that is more stable than the orbitals of the separated atoms. And when we have something that's antibonding or an antibonding orbital, we're going to also give it the uh, nomenclature star here. So one sigma star u is an antibonding orbital, which is a sigma uh, symmetry type, and it is undulata antisymmetric with respect to inversion. Then the same type of thing happens with the 2s orbitals. We have 2 sigma g and 2 sigma star u. Then with our 2p orbitals, we saw how the px and py uh, work differently when they overlap than the pz. The pz forms this orbital up here, which is going to be our 3 sigma g, and then its antibonding orbital is going to be the 3 sigma star u. But the 2px and the 2py orbitals, those each overlap to form these uh, two degenerate pi molecular orbitals over here. So we can call this the 1pi, and pi bonding orbitals are of undurata symmetry, they're of U. And then we have the same uh, antibonding orbitals, there are two degenerate antibonding orbitals of pi type, and they are uh, pi g. So this is 1 pi star g. And in this case, the way I'm going to discuss this is in terms of these two degenerate orbitals here. So we can have either one, two, three, or four electrons in this energy level. There are two spatial orbitals and thus four spin orbitals, so we can fit four electrons in there. Sometimes people discuss these in terms of, say, uh, pi 2x, sorry, pi 2px or pi 2py. I'm just going to label them by these uh rankings of their energy and treat them at, in, uh, in aggregate here. So they can hold up to four electrons in these two separate spatial orbitals from the px and py orbitals. And this diagram that I've got here works for the H2 molecule all the way up until the N2, uh, all the way up till nitrogen. Then what happens beyond that when you go to oxygen, there's a switching. The 3 sigma g actually becomes more stable than the 1 pi u. So you see the 1 pi u is actually higher in energy now than the 3 sigma g. And so what we actually got here is that those two orbitals change there. So when you see this type of diagram, you're going to see uh, two different forms of this based off of where whether we're talking about something from hydrogen to nitrogen or whether we're talking about oxygen, fluorine, and neon. So over here, everything else is the same. We've got one sigma g, one sigma star u, two sigma g, two sigma g, two sigma star u, and then one pi star g, sorry, one, uh, yes, one pi star g, and three sigma star u. Okay, so these are our energy levels. So just like with atoms, once we have these energy levels in our molecular orbital diagram, we just use the Aufbau principle and start adding in electrons. So the simplest molecule we can have would be H2. So if we have H2, we just start filling up electrons. So H2 is going to have uh, two electrons. So we just fill them up, uh, one spin up, one spin down. So as we saw before, the ground state configuration of H2 was just one sigma g, two. Helium, there's two more electrons, one from each atom. So helium, you would have one, two, three, four electrons. So for helium, we'd have one sigma g, two, one sigma star 
u2 two electrons in the sigma g bonding orbital two electrons in the sigma u antibonding orbital and then this just continues all the way up the line and we just want to keep in mind that when we're going over here to like oxygen and fluorine and neon that we have uh, this differing, differing in energy levels here. So let's do this for oxygen. For oxygen, we're going to have, well, the atomic charge is eight. So we're going to have eight electrons that come from each oxygen. So we're going to have 16 electrons total. So let's fill up 16 electrons in this orbital diagram here. So we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then on these degenerate orbitals here, we fill them up same uh, with the with Hund's rules as well. So we have 11, 12, putting them in the separate orbitals with the same spin first. Then 13, 14, 15, and 16. So we've actually got two unpaired uh, electrons in the O2 molecule. So this predicts that the O2 molecule has unpaired electrons and thus is going to be what is called paramagnetic. It will interact with an with a magnetic field rather strongly because of the way these these unpaired electrons work. And if you do the typical kind of valence molecular, if you do the typical kind of valence bond theory in terms of O2, you won't get this prediction here. So this is really the the reason why molecular orbital theory is thought to be a really good theory is the fact that it can predict the fact that the ground state of oxygen is paramagnetic, that it has unpaired electrons. If you think about things just in terms of kind of this overlap of val uh, valence things, then you don't get that same uh, prediction there if you're talking about what's called valence bond theory, which is the kind of predecessor to this type of molecular orbital way of thinking where you have this linear combination of atomic orbitals here. So that, that'll be the last one we fill in here. So let's write the whole configuration thus for O2. Uh, looks like I skipped it in here. Okay, so I'll add it to the list at the end. Should be between oxygen and fluorine there, or should be between nitrogen and fluorine there. All right, so we have, starting from the bottom, one sigma G2, one sigma star U2, two sigma G, Keep writing that as a G. Two sigma G two, two sigma U star two. Um, then we go up to three sigma G two. Um, dot dot dot. Continuing on the next line, together we have one pi U four, and one pi star G. So again, uh, there are different ways that people do it for this these terms here. Um, just pay attention to what um, the various way it's it's taught in your course. Um, I'm doing it this way that I'm treating these two pi orbitals here, these two spatial orbitals as as one energy level. There, uh, some people treat them as uh, pi two px and pi two py, and this as sigma two pz. Um, just whatever whatever your course goes with, just go with that. But this would be the ground state electron configuration according to these, this diagram for O2. And we looked at that also for things like helium. And we got these two different diagrams here where these uh, three sigma g and one pi u orbitals switch in energy between nitrogen and oxygen. So that's the basics of electron configurations for uh, diatomic molecules. Works pretty much the same way it does for atoms. You basically find out what the energy levels are, then fill them up from the alpha principle, and if you've got degenerate orbitals, then use Hunt's rules, filling them up uh, one electron in an orbital at a time with the same spin.